Okay, right. So as you all know, the health workforce is the key input to any health system, right? So it's, we are very, very concerned about the health, in, in, uh, health workforce. They are the key ingredient of our health system. And as of uh, now, we have about 150,000 health workforce in the Ministry of Health, which consists of about 22,000 medical officers, that's 6,000 nursing officers, and about 2,200 to 2,300 uh, consultants, which is including acting. Uh, both certified, we have about 2,100. And out of our budget, we spend more than 50% for the salaries and wages for the health workforce. So more than 50% of the budget goes for to maintenance of the health workforce. And who funds this health? 52% from the out-of-pocket expenditure, 43% from the government, 4% corporations, so on and so forth. And we spend very little on health. Uh, we spend about 3.4 to 3.6 on GDP, on health. GDP is the gross domestic product, and the world average is about 10%. And out of the 195 countries in the world, only 19 have a lower percentage of GDP than us. If you consider the government expenditure, health expenditure as a percentage of government's total expenditure has been around five. So why I am telling all these is, now if you take three countries, say Niger, Central African countries, Sri Lanka and Australia, where we get the population of these three countries is the same, around 2021 20, million. But Niger cannot do what Sri Lanka is doing right now because the Niger economy's per capita GDP is $360, whereas ours is 3,900. So Niger cannot have the same health infrastructure as what we are having today overnight because of their economic uh, stability and the economic, how robust their economy is. Same applies to Sri Lanka versus Australia. We cannot do what Australia is doing now overnight because our per capita or the economy is 3,900 as against 56,000. So when you do uh, about the health facilities, carders and everything, the economy of the country also will have to be considered. As I told you earlier, ministry has about 2,100 both certified consultants and the ratio of medical officer to consultant is about 10 to one. As of now, we have about more than 3,000 pre and post MD trainees in the system. And according to the predictions, the Ministry of Health needs about 4,800 consultants by 2025. So there's a long gap to be filled. And the ministry needs to recruit around 280 to 300 new consultants every year in around 60 specialties. So when I say around 300, it's almost on, we recruit a new consultant on a daily basis, every day, if you take out the Saturday weekends, uh, I mean, every working day, there's a new consultant coming and reports and we recruit them. And out of the consultants who go abroad and who get their board certification, around 12%, uh, they leave the Ministry of Health. This is across the, all the specialties. Some specialties are very much higher than this, some specialties a little bit less than this. So the weighted average is about 12%. The average age of a consultant as of uh, recent years, it's about 42 years, and the average age of both certifications is about 32 years, which I think by international standards is a little bit too long. As you all know, like we stay three years after uh, at least two years to get into the medical school, then for interns another year, then the post interns another year. So all those factors have contributed, and now both certification comes a little bit later. And the, there's a tendency that are less takers in certain specialities and certain specialities, the vice versa. Now the trend is there's more and more demand in subspecialties, like the relatively new specialties like geriatric medicine, sports medicine, emergency medicine, critical medicine, they are the new specialties which comes up. Uh, what we see now is there are more and more females who become specialists. And the Ministry of Health spends around 11 million to produce the MD qualified consultant. It's a big money, taxpayers' money. This is in addition to the cost for the MBBS degree. Now, the ministry has released its card of positions as of May 2020 to HIM. And when you prepare the carders, the ministry has no separate card for, for specialties, say how many uh, carders for surgeons, how many carders for physicians or pediatricians, so on and so forth. We have a block card, which is called SL3. Uh, medical specialist card. 
and that has been approved by the Treasury. And as of now, the Ministry absorbs all the specialists who are qualified from PGIM. And we have published a circular uh, dated uh, 30th March, uh, 3rd March 2020, circular number 0108-2020, which gives a very good guideline. What are the specialities we are going to have in different levels of hospitals? So if anybody was interested to think, okay, when I come back, will I be posted to a base hospital A or a base hospital B, or can I start straight away with a bigger hospital? You go through this circular, it's on the web, and it says, okay, we are going to put this category of specialists only in this category of hospital and above. So this will give you a good guideline where you, uh, you will know that you will work after your both certification. Uh, what about the uh, employment opportunities? Uh, uh, my previous speaker spoke about the public health, uh, the private health sector, and the uh, about the Vino city sectors earlier. So, as far as the government sector is concerned, we are growing at about eight percent annually, and uh, the opportunities in the Vino city were already mentioned. And there's more global opportunities for specialists, especially after UK moving out of uh, EU and the emerging pandemics. So, uh, if you are after you are both certified, if you are to remain in the Ministry of Health, as you know, while remaining in the Ministry of Health, you can engage in private practice. That's the dual practice, right? So you will get the benefit of being in the Ministry of Health, as well as you can supplement your income by dual practice. And more than that, uh, most of the people might not know, if you work for the Ministry for 20 years, you can retire with a pension, right? If you work for 20 years, 20 years roughly about when you are in your early 50s, if you join uh, this 20 years, mind you, is calculated not from the day you become a consultant, but the day you become the medical officer. So uh, you are after 20 years, that's it. When you're about late 40s or early 50s, you can retire with a pension of about 75% of your basic. Maximum you can go for pension is about 85% of the basic that's after 30 years of service. So about the other categories, people have already spoken. So this is the Ministry of Health. So the uh so is one of the most becoming america specialist is one of the most sought after and well respected profession and becoming a america specialist very competitive in sri lanka context and if i had to put in probability forms when you were born at the time of birth your probability of becoming a medical specialist was 0 0.00094 but now you after you have become a consultant is 0.2 percent or 0.2 the probability so, and Sri Lanka is one of the few countries in the whole world which provides free postgraduate medical education. So don't miss this chance. And I appreciate your virtual presence. Any questions could be taken. Thank you. Over.